Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we're going to talk about pneumonia. First of all, what is pneumonia? It is an inflammation of the lung parenchyma, which can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi or different kind of chemicals. Also, for example, gastric acid when it is inhaled. We can classify pneumonia according to different criteria. The first one I want to talk about is the classification by the pathology. It can be divided in alveolar pneumonia, affecting the alveoli, and interstitial pneumonia, affecting the interstitium, so the connective tissue between the alveoli and the blood vessels. Alveolar pneumonia can be further divided in bronchopneumonia and lower pneumonia. As you can see on the poster, bronchopneumonia is affecting several different spots or loci within usually both lungs and also it extends over several lobes. Lobar pneumonia, as the name indicates, is only affecting one lobe, but then the entire area of this one lobe. Interstitial pneumonia can be either acute or chronic, and it is often idiopathic, so that the pathogen is unknown or the cause of the pneumonia, but it can be infectious or by inhalation of noxious substances, as for example cigarette smoke. By etiology, we can differentiate into community-acquired pneumonia, so outside the hospital in a social setting, or nosocomial pneumonia, which is either hospital-acquired or ventilator-acquired. So if a patient is intubated for a long time, bacteria are more likely to climb down the uh, larynx and the trachea because the calf reflex is suppressed in those patients. Also, we can divide pneumonia by comorbidities. So primary pneumonia, if the patient has no other diseases or is primarily considered healthy. And their subdivision is the infant pneumonia when very young children or just born children get a pneumonia or secondary pneumonia in immune-compromised patients, for example, HIV or leukemia, or patients that have diabetes, COPD, or any other kind of lung disease, the patients that have cancer, because all those are making it more likely for bacteria to linger in the lungs or to climb down the trachea into the lungs and spread there. Also, we can divide it by the clinical presentation. It is either considered typical meaning the alveolar pneumonia, or atypical, meaning the interstitial pneumonia. Also, different pathogens are known to be specific for the different kinds of pneumonia. For the alveolar type, or the typical type, it's usually Haemophilus influenzae, Streptococcus pyogenes, Legionella pneumophila, Staphylococcus aureus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is especially in cystic fibrosis patients seen. For the interstitial pneumonia, especially the respiratory syncytial virus, the influenza virus and parainfluenza virus, adenovirus and the coronaviridae are known. Of the coronaviridae family, it's primarily the SARS-CoV-2 and the MERS-CoV-2 virus. Then we have a statistic of around 40 to 50 percent of pneumonias being due to streptococcus pneumonia, which is usually diagnosed by cultivating the sputum, where there are increased neutrophils and gram-positive diplococci visible. In 20 to 25% of all pneumonias, the pathogen is unknown. So to the community-acquired pneumonias. As I said, Legionella pneumophila is one of the leading pathogens causing pneumonia. It is considered a facultative parasite, and it's the leading cause of Legionnaire's disease which was discovered in the 1970s in Philadelphia, when several veterans got an atypical pneumonia after a conference where the air conditioner was contaminated. And Legionella antigens can be seen in the urine, or there's a positive fluorescent antibody test on sputum. However, the, to culture, the sputum or the blood is gold standard. To hemophilia influenza, it often causes a pneumonia after a viral respiratory infection, 
and a descending lar laryngotracheobronchitis leads to airway obstruction by a dense fibrin-rich exudate and then that kind of leads to the dropping of bacteria within the airways and pulmonary consolidation due to the exudate so it creates a favorable environment for the bacteria to spread and culture there. Then Moraxella catarralis which is a pathogen which was considered part of the normal flora until a few years back. It's also one of the causes for bacterial pneumonia, especially in elderly. It's actually the second most common cause of COPD exacerbations after Haemophilia influenza. And staphylococcal pneumonia often creates abscesses, so uh, encapsulated inflammation with central necrosis, often just beneath the pleura. And especially IV drug users are at risk for developing uh, staphylococcal pneumonia. Then for nosocomial pneumonias, so those that are acquired in a hospital setting, Pseudomona ergonosa is one of the most important pathogens. It's often seen in cystic fibrosis patients and often spreads through the pulmonary blood vessels to extra pulmonary sites where it can lead to Pseudomonas septicemia, which means that the uh, bacteria are contained in the blood, which is a very fulminant situation and very dangerous situation for the patient. Then Klebsiella pneumonia is the most frequent gram-negative pathogen and this most often occurs in malnutrition patients, especially chronic alcoholics. And Klebsiella often produces a viscous capsular polysaccharide leading to the production of thick and gelatinous sputum, so that's one of the clinical symptoms of a Klebsiella pneumonia. Other symptoms of pneumonia include cough, which can be either dry or productive, with a thick yellow, green, brown or bloody sputum. Yellow green usually indicates bacteria or some kind of purulent sputum, while brown or red bloodish sputum indicates that there was damage of the blood vessels. Brownish sputum often indicates that blood came in contact with oxygen and created hemosiderin, which appears brownish or bloody when the blood is still fresh within the sputum. Also dyspnea, tachycardia, fever and a general feeling of malaise and fatigue are very common in pneumonia. Now I want to talk more about lobar pneumonia. It has four characteristic stages, which are important to memorize. So the first stage is congestion. It's usually the first 24 hours where outpouring of exudate, so protein-rich fluid, happens into the alveoli and this leads to stasis of the veins in the lungs. And here the lung appears heavy, edematous and fluid-filled. Then the second stage is red hypotization. It usually lasts for a few days where inflammatory infiltrate containing neutrophils, macrophages and lymphocytes and also red blood cells are extravasated from the capillaries. That's why the whole lung appears reddish and thick and gets kind of glossy appearance. And this is also why the stage is called red hepatization because the lungs look kind of like a liver with this dark red color and this heavy mass with this glossy surface. So the third stage is the grey hepatization. It's also usually lasting a few days and here destruction of the erythrocytes or red blood cells occurs. But there is accumulation of fibrin and white blood cells or leukocytes. This fibrin and the uh, leukocytes are why the lungs appear kind of greyish. And this is also why it's called grey hepatization because the red blood cells from the second stage are removed and a grey color or white greyish color is left behind. The fourth stage is resolution. It's usually after 8 to 10 days after the infection and this is where exudate and inflammatory cells are removed and the underlying alveoli are preserved so their structure is not destroyed. This infection can lead to different complications one of them I mentioned before that was bacteremia so that uh, bacteria can find their way through the capillaries into the general blood circulation and can also reach other sites there. That can lead, for example, to 
uh, bacteremic dissemination into the brain, the heart valves, the pericardium, kidney, spleen and the joints. That can lead to meningitis, endocarditis and many different complications outside the lung. Then within the lung it can lead to abscess formation or empyema and also to organization of exudate so that they're kind of like fibrin strands connecting the alveoli and the different structures within the parenchyma together. You can imagine that it's kind of like a glue which fixes the structures together where they weren't supposed to be fixed. And also it can lead to pleural effusion, so a collection of water exudate outside the lungs within the pleural space. Now I want to mention the histology of pneumonia. We differentiate again between bronchopneumonia and lower pneumonia. In bronchopneumonia we have many neutrophils in the bronchi and the bronchioles and the uh, alveoli around them. Then we have lipid pneumonia, which can sometimes happen in bronchopneumonia, where we have a occurrence of lipid-laden macrophages. And in lower pneumonia, we have the differentiation again between the different stages. So in the first stage, we have congestion and a few neutrophils as an inflammatory reaction to the bacteria, which we usually can also see in the histology, depending on the staining. Then in the second stage we have congestion, red blood cells, many neutrophils and also some fibrin. So this was the red hepatization stage where the lung appears red and heavy and fluid filled. In the third stage, the gray hepatization, we have fibrinopurulent exudate and the organization of the fibrin strands. Sometimes we can see hemosiderin when the red blood cells are being lysed and we will see less bacteria and also less neutrophils as the inflammatory reaction is about to dab off. In the fourth stage, the resolution, we have a resorption of the exudate. Sometimes there are some fibrin, fibrinous strands left behind, but in general the lung parenchyma will resemble a healthy lung much more than it would in the other three stages. What both of the different pneumonias have in common is that the septa are widened and edematous and that we have in general more cells in especially the inflammatory cells which are there to fight the infection. That's it with the video. If you have any questions, post it in the comments. I will try to answer. And if you liked the video, I would be very happy if you could subscribe.